Tonight on Life on the Rock, we have Aurora Griffin who will tell us about maintaining your faith in college. We have a cool to be Catholic video called Make a Mark and Brother Leo will tell us about building your faith and much more. Welcome to Life on the Rock. Tonight our guest is Aurora Griffin. She's a graduate from Harvard. She graduated the top 5% of her class, went on to be a Rhodes Scholar, and she's written a book about how she stayed Catholic at Harvard. Very secular place in many ways, but she found a thriving faith community, yeah. contributed to it, so not only kept the faith, but grew in her faith, and she shares how she did that tonight. I think the situation that um, when she went into, a lot of parents are worried about where to send your child to college? How, how is my child going to keep the faith that, I, that I've handed on? And Aurora talks about being equipped. Know what you're going into. So she says, first of all, you need to go to Mass every week. You need to be praying. You need to be going to confession frequently, praying the rosary, and really have a, a good, strong prayer life. And to be able to be um, a dialogue, um, a person of dialogue, rather, to be able to build bridges. And that's what she talked about in her own life was building bridges and making connections and, right, and relationships. The, so the book has 40 tips about keeping your faith, but her book is more about than just simple tips. She also gives fresh insights to the faith. Mm -hmm. She graduated from Harvard, you know, top 5% of her class, went on to be a Rhodes Scholar. She has something to say because she's lived the faith and studied it. We also have a Building Your Faith segment with Brother Leo. And now we want to show you a cool to be Catholic video called Make a Mark by Carrie Elizabeth Weinheimer. Aurora, you've written a book about how you stayed Catholic at Harvard. Can you describe the cultural, university, secular landscape to our viewers? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's, it's no surprise that keeping your faith uh, at, on a secular campus is a challenge. Um, you add in the secular party scene to um, what our culture teaches about uh, sex and relationships to uh, professors who uh, ridicule the faith. Uh, there are no lack of challenges for people who want to be people of faith, especially publicly uh, at places like Harvard. And I know I read in the book, your favorite saint is St. Augustine, I think. And he was at a time, right, when civilization right. was crumbling. Do you identify with his challenges? I do think we have it better uh, than Augustine did. He, he was up against uh, some really tough stuff and I do see that you know we, we at least have a Christian culture that we can um, we can go back and build from again right when we talk about uh, being conservative sometimes that means uh, conserving uh, in part our Christian roots so I think that um, there's uh, some opportunity for that that Augustine might have uh, struggled with. 
Uh, you make a great point in the book that it's not just about staying Catholic, but you have to, to grow in your faith. And for you, that culminated mm -hmm. in the big fight against this uh, black mass that they wanted to have on campus, the Satanists wanted to have on campus mm -hmm. of Harvard. Can you talk about that, about growing in your faith and, and ultimately opposing this, uh, this mass? Yes, absolutely. So the, um, the build up to that, I think, is that I came to Harvard um, already very sure of my faith. I knew that it was important to me and that I wanted to keep it. I made great Catholic friends throughout college. I talk about that in the book. I went to daily mass um, and kept up various prayer practices. Um, tra kept firing on all fronts, you know. Um, so by the time the black mass rolled around, this was a small group of people who wanted to get together and host a reenactment of a satanic black mass. Uh, there were rumors that they were going to try to steal the Eucharist from the local Catholic church. Um, and so there was uh, there was a lot of anxiety about this. Um, it was during exams, uh, so the decision that was sitting before me was really, what do I do as a faithful college student who has committed myself to living my faith at Harvard, but also committed myself to serious academic study and worked hard for uh, the grades that I had and uh, the opportunities I had for the future. Um, so it came down to this question of, do I put effort into trying to stop this black mass or do I study for my finals? Uh, and in the end, um, I decided to, to put effort towards stopping the black mass. And, you know, it's, uh, it's funny how this stuff works out because there still ended up being plenty of time sort of out of nowhere to study for finals. Uh, it, it all worked out fine, but it seemed like a, a choice between the two. And I was really blessed to be surrounded by good Catholics who were all making that choice to try to fight the black mass. You make a great point in the book as well about we're so afraid of what the faith's going to take from us, but you write about how the faith gives meaning and improves your, the, cat, the university experience. Talk about that. Yes. So um, this is something that uh, both John Paul and Benedict uh, said early on in addressing young people. Uh, do not be afraid. Um, open wide the doors for Christ and you will find true life. Uh, and that has been a sort of mantra of mine and then an, an anchoring point for the book that I think as young people, especially, we look forward into the future, we say there's so many good things that I could have, uh, but these things seem to take me away from my faith. So what am I going to choose? And the reason why I wrote the book and what I really want to share with young people is that you don't actually have to choose because if you choose Christ then everything else about the college experience, the friends, the academics, the uh, getting to meet all of these interesting people, um, the opportunities that come after, these things will all, these things all came to me because of my faith and never in spite of it. I'd like to jump to a, a couple of practical things you write about as well. You said, well, first, maybe, how should it, what would you, how would you advise a young person in choosing a school? What kind of advice would you give to them about that? Mm. That's a great question, and it, it does depend on the person, right? So for my personality, I knew that I was going to be okay in a place where my faith was challenged. I had really good intellectual and faith formation. Uh, my father taught me himself from the catechism when I was young. So I knew that when I got into a place where a lot of people weren't Catholic and were challenging me about it, that I would rise to that and thrive um, in having to fight for it. I don't think that's the case with everybody. I think people have different uh, temperaments. People are at different points in their faith when they come to college. And so for some people, it actually is better to put themselves in a supportive environment where they can be encouraged uh, to grow in their faith alongside their peers. In that case, I do encourage people to try to go to a, a school that is faithfully Catholic and really intentional about cultivating that identity. Um, but you know, anywhere, at any college, part of the point of the book is even at Harvard, um, you can keep your faith. And more than that, you can thrive in your faith. So it's a matter of making the prudent decision for you. OK, well, we're going to take a, a quick break. and we come back, We'll talk more about some of the practical tips that you give in the book. 
More with Aurora Griffin after the break. Now back to our interview with Aurora Griffin. Aurora Griffin, you give uh, practical points about staying Catholic you know, on university campuses. One of the things you say is to find other Catholics if they are there. Tell us about that. Yes, so what I tell uh, college students about this, or high school students who are thinking about going to college, is there is gonna be a moment in the future uh, in which your parents have just dropped you off at school, you're alone, uh, you know, you're in your dorm room, and you're trying to decide, I'm making the first decision for myself as an adult. I'm independent, what am I gonna do? And I say, remember that moment and go find the Catholics, uh, which is exactly what I did. My mom dropped me off. She said goodbye. We were both sad. And then uh, I went straight to St. Paul's and I found out when are the masses? When do the students get together? Who can I talk to? And I was, I was very worried, actually, that there weren't any Catholics. I talk about this in the book, that I thought that there was this really outdated website for the Harvard uh, Catholic community at the time, and I was worried there were no Catholics, and that was just absolutely not true. There were tons of Catholics there, and there are at most places if you just know to go look for them. And obviously, too, you need a, a strong daily prayer life. You write quite a bit about that in the book. Mm -hmm. And I, was, I liked what you said about spiritual reading and spiritual writing. Tell us about that. Mm -hmm. Sure, these two practices go hand in hand. Um, so separate from Lexio Divina or attending mass, um, reflecting on the word of God, uh, we have this category of spiritual reading, which is reading things that are related to the faith, um, but not necessarily revelation, um, just to, to nurture your mind um, to, and to take a step forward from where you're at. It can be, it, it doesn't have to be anything in particular. It has to be what you're interested in and would actually read. And then I found that my spiritual reading went to a whole different level once I started writing um, about my reflections to them. Nothing complicated, nothing time consuming, just a point here or there so that I can come back and look back over uh, the last couple months, the last year if I want to, and, and see where God has been leading me in my reading. And you also made a great point about uh, chastity and how that can be a danger to the faith, mm. you know, depending on who you're dating and their views of chastity. Tell us about mm. that. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so what I mentioned in the book is that I think that the number one reason why I saw people who came into Harvard with solid faiths uh, then walk away from their faith was because they started dating somebody who didn't share the faith with them. And it could be somebody whom they admired for their virtue, who had common goals, who seemed to be you know, totally right, except didn't have the faith. Um, and it, it's a hard situation. These are, um, th these are tough calls to make, but what I say in the book is that it's, and I agree with now, uh, is that it's so important uh, to make sure that you're on the same page with the person you're dating in terms of chastity. So, you know, the, the faith is, it, for me, it's a non-negotiable. For, for other people, you know, they've got, I, I think it's more prudent to date someone of the Catholic faith. But the non-negotiable thing is chastity. Because if you have one view of it from the Catholic Church, meaning that sexuality, um, that sexual expression is reserved for marriage, um, if your partner doesn't agree with that, um, you're gonna have a heck of a time actually living it out. And then once you fall into it, continuing that sin, it pulls you out of mass and out of daily prayer and things because you feel that tension, right? And people, I think so. Yeah. I thought that was a great point. That and I think, pe pe I think, yeah, people feel scared then or, or guilty. Like, you know, they, uh, if, they, if they aren't being chased, then they're in mass and they're like, oh, people know, or, you know, I don't belong here, which is not true. Um, the Catholic Church has high standards, but one thing we've been really reflecting on uh, under Pope Francis's guidance is how much mercy is there from the church in addition to those high standards. Mm -hmm. I was impressed in the book about how active you were in clubs and activities, and, but you write about mm -hmm. making time for that Sunday rest, you know, not just the academics alone, mm -hmm. but talk about the importance mm -hmm. of Sunday rest, even for a college student. 
Well, I think it's so easy to get drawn into uh, this rhythm where we're working all the time, 24 hours a day. And then if you take a break, it's just stealing away from things you should really be doing. And there's no time that's really set apart where you know that you can rest. The thing about making yourself take Sunday off, it takes more discipline. You have to plan it out. You have to uh, make sure that you, you do your laundry or clean your room or get your assignments done on Saturday. And that's when a lot of people are, are hanging out. So it takes a deliberate effort. But then if there's nothing better, uh, I think, than waking up on a Sunday morning and knowing that you just have the day uh, to reset, to spend time with God, to worship, to be with your friends, it really adds a whole different rhythm to the week and a different, um, it enables you to, I think, to do more. Uh, I attribute a lot of my being able to be in all of these different clubs and uh, be pushing as hard as I was in my academics uh, to the fact that I knew I was gonna have time off every week. And we have about a minute left. You went to daily mass through Harvard and being a Rhodes Scholar. How is that possible? I did. <laughs> It's only half an hour a day. <laughs> uh, That's unthinkable for you know, most students. We, we spend half an hour doing all kinds of things. Well, um, I would say it just it's one of those things that uh, it gives so much more than it takes from you. You know, it does, it does take an effort. You, you do have to commit to it and move other things around it. But when you do, uh, your time multiplies. You meet great people. Uh, I, I really can't imagine my experience uh, in college and grad school without Mass. It was, it was my anchor. Yeah. Well, you've written a, a marvelous book and you've uh, just a great witness to the faith. So we look forward to hearing from you in the Thank future you. and what you're up to. So Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Thank you. And now here's Brother Leo with Building Your Faith. Hi, I'm Brother Leo Mary, and in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 105 to 108, the Church is teaching us about Scripture, the Bible, how it was written. There is one primary author, that is the Holy Spirit, and there are many other authors, they call it secondary authors. This pen right here can be a good example of that. You have one pen, but you have ten different color inks. So you have one primary author, the Holy Spirit, and He inspires the other authors, the secondary authors, to write. And so each one of those secondary authors would be, be like a different color on this pen. Now, the Holy Spirit uses all the gifts of those secondary authors. He doesn't just write through them and override them. He uses all their gifts. So St. Luke is a physician. He's a doctor. So when St. Luke writes the Gospel of St. Luke, he uses those gifts as a doctor, and he writes in a doctor's way of writing. Maybe not as messy. And then you have St. Matthew. He's like a, he's a tax collector. So he does a lot of numbers. And so in Matthew's Gospels, you're going to see numbers, and things fit together with a lot of numbers. And that's because the Holy Spirit is using the gifts of each one of those authors. And that's all the way back to the Old Testament. It's the same Holy Spirit who's wrote the Old Testament, the same Holy Spirit who wrote the New Testament. So that's why it's inspired. It's inspired by God. Now the sacred scriptures, the Bible, has no error in it. The Holy Spirit got these authors to write only what He wanted them to write, whatever He writ wanted written, and no more. That's the Holy Spirit. He says, whatever He wanted written, and no more. There is no error in the Bible because the Holy Spirit is the main primary author of the sacred scripture. Now in the catechism it says very beautifully, we must acknowledge that the books of scripture firmly, faithfully, and without error teach that truth which God for the sake of your salvation wished to be confided to the sacred scriptures. So God is the one who gave us the Bible and there is no error. So when you read paragraphs 105 to 108 you understand more about how the Bible was written. God bless you.
Brother Leo gave us a clever meditation on the Word yeah. of God. I love that image of the pen with the different colors and the different writers, how the Holy Spirit uses you know, our talents to give us the Word of God in writing in the Scripture. And that's exactly how uh, the Word of God came into existence. I mean, the Word of God, the Holy Spirit is the author of the Scriptures. And if we think about the Gospels, we have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are talking about a lot of the same accounts, but we have them through four different lenses. Mm -hmm. So St. Luke is a doctor. Mm -hmm. So we're going to hear a lot about the miracles of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to hear a lot through St. Matthew. We're going to, he uses numbers a lot. He was a tax collector. Right. <laughs> so in St. Matthew's Gospel, he uses uh, the numbers. Right. That would be yeah. a, so the important thing is the Word of God is God's Word to us, God speaking to us, recorded. And we could guide, use that to guide our life, you know, to inform our life and how that we can make a mark, you know, that Cool to be Catholic video, how we can make a mark in this life by living by the faith, you know, living with faith, infusing everything we do. And Aurora made a great point about that on our Rock Talk uh, segment that she said, so often at times we feel like the faith is going to take something from us that we want you know, as opposed to the world's message that, hey, you Christians yeah. are losers. But she said faith gives meaning to our life, and it enriched her college experience. You know, it helped to give her, helped her relationships and friendships. It gave her great memories, you know, and it gave her a motivation to be a good student, informed her academic life. She said that, that faith helped her to, to work hard as a student, you know, that these, this time mattered. She wanted to serve God in this life. And truly, faith makes you free. Mm -hmm. You know, so many people think that when we give our lives over to God, then like you said, uh, some people think that it's going to take away from their life, right, but really right. makes us more free. It right. makes us more free to be who we really are. So one of her tips was spiritual reading and spiritual writing, that we write down our inspirations and reflections on what we've read. So our Into the Vineyard challenge this week is to read the Bible. Put some time into prayerfully reading the Bible, to draw inspiration, to see how it can apply to your life, to guide you in your life and all that you do. And we call that Lexio Divina, divine reading. And just open up the Bibles, especially the Gospels. Read the Gospel account. And it could be five minutes a night. You don't have to read a whole book of the Bible in one night. You can just read a couple passages and maybe just read them over and over again, maybe two or three times. And Say, uh, Blessed Paul VI would also say this, that we need to pray and read the Bible at the same time because we can't just read the Word of God, just like Mother Angelica said, just like a, a magazine. Right. But we need to put blood and guts into it. Right. Mother Angelica said, put blood and guts into reading the Bible. Put yourself into the Bible. Right. Put you into the Bible. Where do I fit into the story? So Aurora was a great uh, witness to us about going into the vineyard with our faith, informed by the Word of God, informed by the teachings of the church, you know, inspired by the Holy Spirit to go make a difference. You know, and she did a great witness to that. So we'll give you a final blessing to send you into that vineyard. May our Heavenly Father shine His face upon you. May He give you His peace. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We'll see you next week on Life on the Rock.